simple gospel? Well, the purpose, everybody knows what the purpose of the gospel is? I'm assuming yes. Okay. So the purpose purpose of the gospel, in case you don't know, is to proclaim the good news um, of what God has done in and through Jesus so that people will respond. Um, So I think we can all agree that that's not just like knuckle bump good information. I mean, it is knuckle bump good information, but it's way bigger than that. Um, a response that comes from entering into a relationship with the Lord um, changes our hearts, changes our lives, and changes our forever. Um, so it's, it's not just a story. It's not just the simple gospel. It's an invitation um, for life um, and for changed life. So this song I'm going to teach you guys, it's called Simple Gospel. I love this song. I'm just saying.
And this is the time in the service when we just take a few moments and come to a place of confession. I'm reading a book called The Divine Con Conspiracy by Dallas Willard. It's an older book, actually. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that has struck me is we, we've just missed um, the truth of the gospel. We've just missed it in our culture. And one of the things that Jesus um, uh, said through uh, John, the disciple, is if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so let's just take 30 seconds to reflect on that. Whatever you brought in here that's keeping you from understanding the love and the grace and the mercy of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I just want to invite you right now in these 30 seconds to just let it go. Let the Lord have it and let you go on with him uh, where he's called you to be, how he's called you to be. So let's just take 30 seconds and then I'll pray after that. we just come right now just in the name of Jesus just pray that all the things we brought that are keeping us from being loved by you the way that you love us I ask Lord that right now we would just let them go and just sit here and relax in the saving and merciful and gracious love of Jesus and we thank you in his name Amen this is the time we come to the offering as well and if you're not uh, don't call waypoint home we don't want you to feel any pressure whatsoever if you do feel called waypoint home and feel led to give this morning we're going to pass the baskets through the rows and i would love for you to to uh just go as the lord leads with that and then in the meantime just enjoy the music thanks
If you have your Bibles with you, today's scripture lesson comes to us from Matthew 13, starting with the third verse. Listen to the word of God. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, look, he who has ears, let him listen. The disciples then came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? And Jesus responded and said, this is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. If you will be ever hearing but never understanding, you will be ever seeing but never perceiving, for this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are you, for your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Doctrine is not an affair of the tongue, but of the life. It is not apprehended by the intellect and memory merely, like other branches of learning, but is received only when it possesses the whole soul and finds its seat in habitation in the inmost recesses of the heart. Now, if you're visiting with us, don't worry. That's not my normal delivery style. That's why they were laughing at me. That was actually a sermon by John Calvin, a preacher from 500 years ago who would stand in a pulpit like this to deliver that message. And while that message maybe sounded differently, at the end of the day, actually what he was trying to accomplish, what he was trying to say, is the same thing I want you all to hear today. Bottom line up front. The gospel is a story that doesn't give us information and instruction, but it's a story that seeks to transform our whole lives. This is a story that Jesus wants to invite us into. And when I was in seminary, I had a professor who had talked about there's two types of preachers, two types of worship experiences. Those in which you walk in and it takes the people of the street and draws them into the presence of God and you sit beneath the formal teaching of an educated pastor and he uses all these big words like sanctification and justification and superlapsarianism. And while you're in the room, you might not really understand what's going on. In fact, I had a friend once say it took him like seven years to be able to understand that type of preaching. But you feel like you're in the presence of God just because of the formalness of the language and the environment and the space. And then my professor said there's another type of teaching. One that seeks to take these complex ideas and make them simple. That seeks to move from the pulpit to the pews and out onto the pavement. That seeks to translate the God's big words into our everyday lives. And we're doing this series now over the next month about the parables of Jesus. And it's that type of preaching is how I see Jesus teaching. That he's taking parables, he's taking everyday language in order to explain big God concepts. I mean, if you look at even how scripture was written, the main two ways scripture was written, languages it was written in, was Hebrew and Greek. 
And Hebrew at this time period was a very kind of guttural, simple language by this very small tribe of the people of Israel. There was nothing mystical, nothing magical about Hebrew. It was a very plain language. And even the Greek translation, the Greek they used in the Bible was uh, a simple Greek. It wasn't the educated Greek of Homer and the fancy educated Greeks. It was a very approachable, everyday language. You see, God's whole mission was to bring God to earth, to put human flesh on his son, to speak normal everyday language so we could understand who and how much God loves us, the simplicity of the gospel message. And so Jesus came and spoke and taught using everyday language. In fact, One of the things I love about Jesus is that he asks over 307 questions in the Gospels. He only answers eight of them. Jesus was about asking questions and telling stories. He tells 40 parables, over 40 parables, because Jesus wanted to elicit in our hearts, wanted to ask us questions, not give us information, but seek to uncover in our hearts what our hearts desire. The very first words of Jesus in John's gospel is a question that I think beautifully encapsulates his mission. He asks you, what do you want? What are you seeking? What do you desire? You see, Jesus isn't looking to give us information, to give us instructions. He's looking to change our lives and to change our perspectives. Maybe sometimes you've heard of the Bible being an instruction manual. But I'll tell you, this, if this was an instruction manual, it's more confusing than like an Ikea instruction manual. Like it doesn't give you clear guidance on what you should do. Like let's say you're trying to figure out if you should move to Omaha. How are you going to figure that out? Or if you should take that new job. Or if you should marry your girlfriend. Like it doesn't give you clear guidance in that. Maybe you'll do the old tried and true method of trying to figure out God's wisdom where you close your eyes, you grab your Bibles, and you're wondering, should, should I marry this girl? And you, you, you throw it open, and you, you just randomly pick a verse, and you read it, and you happen to pick Genesis 24, 67, where it says, and he married Rebecca, so she became his wife, and he loved her. That's great. But what if your girlfriend's name is Jennifer? Then what do you do? You see, the Bible's not an instruction manual that seeks to give us clear step-by-step instructions to every situation. It's not trying to show us how, excuse me, it's not trying to tell us what we should do in every situation, but rather it's trying to show us how we should live in all circumstances. That, That the Bible is seeking to tell us who God is and who we are. It's seeking to tell us why God loves us so much, why he would send his son for us. It's telling us who and why, not the what's and how's of the world. I love this quote. He says, if you want to inspire people to build a ship, do not command them to gather wood to be assigned tasks and to work, but to show them the endless beauty of the sea. See, Scripture is telling us and showing us the endless beauty of God's love for us. It's inviting us into that story to see how much God loved you. The simplicity of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son into this world, not to condemn it, but to show us how much he loves us. I love to capture the four chapters. I call it the four chapters of the gospel. You can can sum up the entire Bible with these four chapters. Chapter 1 is Genesis 1 and 2, the opening pages of the Bible. And it's a story about how God created us, that we are creatures, that God's in charge, not us. And I think this chapter, it elicits a question from us. What if, what if there was a God who loved you, who created you? who knows you better than yourself. Well, what if there was a God who loved you? That's the beginning question that we begin to wrestle with our faith. And then chapter 2 picks up in Genesis 3, and it runs through the rest of the Old Testament. It shows story after story, man after man, woman after woman, child after child, wrestling with this idea, trying to fix everything on their own 
trying to earn God's love, trying to earn everything, and they keep stumbling and fumbling and making huge mistakes. And the story is showing us that we're all people of need, that, that we're broken. And I think it asks a question of you, what if you can't fix it? What if you can't fix that problem, that sin, that brokenness in your life? What if you can't fix it? Where are you going to turn? And that tees you up for the third chapter. The third chapter, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are, are stories men capture about this man, Jesus, this man who was the Son of God, who came to rescue us, who came to save you, because he realized how much you were in need. And asked, who are you going to allow to save you? Are you going to try to do it yourself, or are you going to trust in your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? And then finally, the fourth chapter picks up from Acts to the end of it, is that we are saved for a purpose. If we've been saved, now what? What are we going to do? See, this is the story that Jesus is trying to show us, how beautiful of story it is that no matter what you have done, no matter what you will do, God loves you. God has forgiven you. God has redeemed you. God knows you by name, and he calls you, and he sends you out. And this is the story he wants you to see and to hear. I mean, did you notice the two commands Jesus gave in that scripture reading? It said, then he told them many things in parables, saying, look. And then it closes, he who has ears, let him listen. Look and listen. That's the invitation of faith, is that we get to look and to listen for what God is up to. It's our, the receptive organs of our lives, our eyes and our ears. We get to receive God's grace, God's love for us. We get to look and to listen for it. Because it's not by our hands that you've been saved, nor is it by our feet. It's not even by our brains. Instead, it is by our eyes that we get to see and our ears we get to hear. And it's our lungs that we get to receive the breath of God. It's these receptive organs that allow us to perceive and receive the grace of Jesus Christ. And that changes the way we see the world. That changes everything. When we receive that gift, using our eyes and our ears, let us look and listen to what God is up to. That's why here at Waypoint, the praise and prayer has become such a hallmark to our worship experience. When we close out the service on Sundays and share where we've seen God at work and where we need God to work is because we want to train each other up to go and to look and to listen for the Lord at work out there. And we believe God's not limited to this hour on Sunday morning, but rather that he is active out there and we want to receive eyes and ears that can see him at work in our ordinary lives. And then the whole purpose is for to show up the next Sunday and get to share what God had showed you, what he had spoken to you throughout the week. That we would take these big ideas of God and that we would put them to work out on the street, looking and listening for what God is up to. So that it doesn't just become information, but it becomes a transformation, a new way of living, a new way to see the world. You see, God's interested in transformation, not information. I mean, we, we live in the information age of information. You've got access to more information than any human in all of history. That at the fingertips, you can find anything you want. I was watching that Ab State UNC game, and I was trying to figure out where uh, that quarterback, Bryce, had played many years before, and I could quickly find all of the information you want. You've got access to. But how much is it changing our world? Right? Don't we still have the same issues of sin and evil and brokenness and bitterness, quite frankly, maybe even more so now. God is not interested in information. He's interested in transformation and a changing of our hearts, a changing of the way that we see the entire world. I love this quote by Kevin DeYoung. He says, God wants us to know him so intimately that his thoughts become our thoughts. His ways our ways, his affections our affections. God wants us to drink so deeply of the scriptures that our heads and our hearts are transformed 
so that we love what he loves and hate what he hates. That we become so involved in the story, we absorb so much of the story that we begin to reflect it out to the world around us because it begins to change us from the inside out. One of my favorite stories I've told you all before was this uh, article out of the United Kingdom about 20 years ago about this like 12-year-old girl and she had had so much Sunny D, had drank so much Sunny Delight that her skin had turned orange. I love that metaphor. She had consumed so much Sunny D that it literally had changed her body from the inside out. And it makes me realize what we consume changes us. What we take in and how much of it we take in will change us. And if we're out there consuming things that, that are destructive and distract us and, and tear us apart, I mean, if you've been on Twitter recently, all of the political vitriol and anger and frustration, what we consume will begin to pour out of us, will change us. And so what, what are you consuming? I mean, I know if I read like a Jack Reacher novel, if I go to some Mission Impossible movie, if I'm coming out into the parking lot, I'm convinced there are like spies in the parking lot waiting for me. Because what we consume begins to change our attitudes and change our hearts. And so are we consuming Scripture, God's story for us, that God loves you, God has forgiven you, God has freed you, are we consuming so much of that that like the Sunny D girl, our, our bodies begin to reflect God's goodness, God's love, God's grace, God's forgiveness, God's mercy to the world around us. That we begin to hear his story in new ways. We begin to see him in new things. That's how I love his closing of that story with why does he tell parables and he tells his disciples, because they've been given new ears to hear. He says, but blessed are your eyes because they see, and blessed are your ears because they hear. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone has surrendered their life to Jesus Christ, the old has gone and the new has come. Our old ways of living, the old things we clung to have gone away, and now we're freed up to live in a new way with new ears and new eyes and new hearts to see things in a new way. A friend of mine is the son of a preacher. He, he's now a preacher, but when he was growing up, he was the son of a preacher. And he'd sit there as a preacher's son on the pew, listening to his dad talk and talk and talk every Sunday. And then in high school one year, he went off to a, a Young Life camp. And while he was at that Young Life camp, he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He had a palpable moment of surrendering his life to Jesus. And he came home from that camp just filled with the Holy Spirit. And he went to church that Sunday, and he sat in the pew, and his dad got up to begin to preach. And as he listened to his dad preach, he's like, man, my dad was on fire. It was amazing. He was like, man, did, did, did my dad go to like preaching camp while I was at Windy Gap? Well, what happened? Like he was just on it today. And so they went out to lunch afterwards. And my friend Jim, when he turned his down, he's like, dad, where, what happened? Like where, where you were really just hitting the gospel message perfectly. And his father turned to him and, and said to him beautifully, he said, son, last week you were given ears to hear and eyes to see what God is doing. Ah, preaching has always been the same. But you have a new perspective to see what's going on. Have we uh, allowed God to change our hearts, to change our eyes? As I was doom scrolling through Twitter, I, I caught this story that was actually helpful and redemptive. It was this beautiful story of this little girl, and this baby is visually impaired, when her parents gave her glasses. And I just want you to see what happens when she gets to see her mom and her dad for the first time. Watch this. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Piper. How are you? Hi, can you see? Can you see? Yeah. Hi, Piper. 
Hi. Honey, can you see? <laughs> I think she can. <laughs> Not a beautiful description of the transformation of the gospel, right? Putting on new glasses, but at first we want to fight it. It's awkward. It's weird. What's going on here? But then if we let those glasses settle in, we get to see our Father's love for us. We get to see the good news of Jesus Christ, that God loves you, that God has forgiven you, that God has accepted you because he sent his son into this world to die for you. And Jesus took on the weight of our sin and our brokenness so that we, we get to smile when we see how much God loves us, when we see his grace poured out for us. In a moment, I'm going to invite Chip to come up and play a song called The Wonderful Cross. And as we stand and as we sing this song, I want you just to look and to listen. I love this song because to me, it paints a beautiful picture of God's love for us. And I would just invite you to look and to listen to how much God loves you. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Wes, uh, this is the time when normally we would do praise and prayer, which is uh, where do you need God to show up? Where have you seen God show up? And where have you seen the Holy Spirit at work uh, in your life using you in somebody else's life? And I want to step back a few weeks. I brought this sign when I preached this summer and brought it a couple times and said, you know, whoever needs it, um, I want you to feel free to grab it. Come what may, whatever happens. And um, I picked that up at, at a shop in Blown Rock this summer and just felt like, you know, that's for somebody that I know. And uh, I had it here for a few weeks this summer and had it up front and nobody grabbed it. And uh, I, frankly, I realized it was for me. <laughs> uh, and I want to share something with you that's just going on for me and for, for him and me, uh, just so you can be in prayer. And uh, just, I've seen God work here. I need him to work here. I just want to let you know what's going on. But I, uh, uh, a while back, got diagnosed with some kidney stuff. And it's not cancer. But at this point, uh, you know, I, many of y'all know I did lose a lot of weight last year. It was not related to this directly at all. Um, but part of what happened last year, I thought it would get better, it actually got a little worse. And so just uh, to tell you guys where things are, I'm in stage four kidney disease uh, of five. Uh, where it's headed is that at some point I will need, you know, either it can stay the same for months or years, it can stay the same, which I hope it will. I'm praying for healing. I'll be honest, got some folks praying for healing. I've seen God, you know, my dad of two types of cancer, I've seen God do amazing things. So I'm praying for that and believing that that is absolutely possible. If it doesn't happen that way, where it would lead would probably be dialysis or uh, and or kidney transplant at some point. And I uh, just want to let you guys know that that's going on. I'm going to ask that you pray uh, just for me and them as we kind of wade through this, uh, particularly for my sweet Pray for him. It'd be great. Um, I honestly, in spite, of, in spite of my tears, I can tell you all, I have seen God. I got new glasses on. I mean, he's given me new glasses for the last several years, to be honest. But I feel like I'm seeing God in amazing ways and seeing the truth of Scripture in a way that I did not know. So I'm excited about this season because I know God's doing something. Uh, just so you do know, we are um, got a great kidney doctor here now. We just recently switched, uh, but we're heading up to Mayo Clinic um, on the 12th, and I've got some testing on the 13th and 14th that they'll do. Uh, uh, somebody got me an in up there, and I'm really glad to be going to Mayo in Rochester, Minnesota. Y'all can pray for that. Uh, so we'll be out that week. Um, but, you know, I just really do would appreciate your prayers for what's going on. And uh, again, I, I need to tell y'all uh, my prayers for both of us, but I need to tell y'all, uh, God has become so real to me in this season, and I'm so grateful. I am so grateful for what he's doing and what he is showing me uh, right now in this season of my life. So thanks for listening. Thanks for uh, your prayers in advance, and uh, that's it. Ask him if you would come up. I'd love to pray over you as well. Um, I just asked Chip if I could pray over him and Emma as well as they walk this road, um, come what may on this. So would you all just join me as I uh, pray? <sighs> Father God, we come to you um, just eager for what you are going to do in and through Chip and the um, Lord, we just ask healing power upon him, Lord Jesus Christ, that your spirit would begin the good work of restoring his body, restoring his kidneys, restoring his health, Lord, so that he can be continuing to faithfully serve you. Lord God, I, I pray as they journey into this next month and they wander and wander and go through tests and wait for results and uh, restless nights and anxious mornings. God, I, I pray that the Spirit would fill them with the peace, a peace that brings hope and comfort in hard times. Lord, I pray for Emma. God, I, I pray that you would just surround her with your grace. Lord, that you would release um, her worry, her wondering what she could or should do. 
oh God, and that she would just draw closer to you. Lord Jesus, I thank you for Chip and his friendship, for his wisdom, for the ways he has helped each of us to see you and your love. And so, Lord, I pray as he goes into doctor's appointments and meets people, that he could just radiate a, a faithfulness in you. Lord God, would you bless him? Would you keep him? Would you put your angels around him that nothing would come to harm or dis destroy or kill or take away from him, but he would regain full health in order to serve your people just a little bit more. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Thank you all for sharing. People of Waypoint, if y'all would stand up for the coordinates. Friends, as you head out this door this morning, where do you need the gospel to transform your heart? Where do you need God to move? Well, what areas can you look and listen and see God at work? And so for a little action step for you all, in order to look and listen, I would encourage you to read the book of Philippians this week. It's short, and it will show you how much God loves you, what it is to live in the joy of the Lord. Because I want you to know that there's a God who created you. God the Father gave you the gift of life because he loved you. He breathed his spirit into your lungs. And then he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to show you the depth of his love, that Christ would surrender everything for you so that you could be set free. And may the Holy Spirit fill you with that peace and that joy and that love you need this day and forevermore. Amen. Y'all have a wonderful Sunday, and I look forward to seeing y'all next week.